Well, this morning is an important day. Today we are beginning a brand new book of the Bible that we're going to work our way through. We're going to work our way through the book of Luke. And you are here today on the first Sunday that we're going to do that. And you will be able to look back in two years and say, I was there when it started. So that, that's a good thing. You think I'm kidding. Um, so uh, it's also a wonderful opportunity because as we open up to Luke chapter 1 and then we get into chapter 2, it's all about the birth of Christ. So this is a perfect time of year to do that. And so uh, I, I anticipate that we'll be able to take some uh, time on Sunday evenings as well. So I'm jumping in. I'm not giving you a lot of background or introduct introductory information. Uh, we'll get to that, you know, once we get through the Christmas season and through 21 days of prayer and fasting in January. Uh, we'll, we'll get to some Sunday nights where we, we dig a little bit deeper. So uh, we'll study God's word as we go through the book of Luke and it's my prayer that it blesses you and encourages you. And today as we start thinking about the birth of Jesus and, and the fact that this season is kind of revolving around the, the nativity, right? We've got a living nativity that's gonna happen on December 15th that we invite you to come back to. And when I think about nativity, the word nativity means birth. But when I think about specifically the birth of Jesus, we keep picturing like the nativity scene. And the birth of Jesus is unique. It's different than any other birth. But, but in some sense, when a child is to be born, what, what we typically have done in the past, if you've had kids in the past, you, you would send out maybe a card that says, you know, we're expecting. Or after you had the baby, it's a card that said, it's a boy or it's a girl. Nowadays, there's gender reveal parties. And that's a big thing, right? And so uh, everybody's trying to figure out more unique ways to do the gender reveal. And it's kind of exciting. Also very dangerous if you've seen some of them on YouTube. Uh, it, so anyway, you can look that up sometime. Uh, but I believe that there's been no better birth announcement or gender reveal than God the Father who said, mm, forget all that, I'm sending an angel. I'm sending angels to announce the birth of my son. And it's not as if it, it was a complete surprise because 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, the prophet Isaiah prophesied that he would come. He said that there's going to come this time that, that there would be one who would set the people free from their oppression, that the rule and reign of his government would have no end, that this king would be king forever and of his kingdom, absolutely, it will exist forever. But then there were 400 silent years before Jesus showed up. There was a long period and a long stretch where nobody really heard from God and people began to lose hope. And it looked as though the light were going out. But then one day, piercing the darkness, Gabriel shows up. And Gabriel has an announcement to two different individuals about two miraculous births, which reminded everybody, God is on the move. Luke chapter 1. As you open up to Luke chapter 1, it's my hope and prayer today that those of you who've come into the house of God today, who maybe experience a lot of stress, fear, worry, anxiety, and problems of this world, that you, that you would pay attention to what the angel says to both Zechariah and to Mary. I believe that there's encouraging words in here for us today. So here we go. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So we have Elizabeth and Zechariah, and they're both descended from priests. And then it says, they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. All right? So all hope of having a child, gone, kind of vanished for them. But God was about to visit them through this angel. And God chose both Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were chosen to be the parents of John. We're going to read about that in a moment. This is John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. This is his parents. And then we read in verse 8. Now, while Zechariah was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. All right, let me give you a little bit of background here. So in that time, there were 24 different divisions of priests, and those divisions would each serve two weeks at the temple. They would kind of rotate. 
They would serve those two weeks, and then there were three special feasts that they would serve at the temple. There would be the, the Feast of Tabernacles. There would be the Feast of Passover, the, the, the Feast of Pentecost, where they would serve. And when it was your division's turn to go to the temple and serve there, each priest would draw lots. They, they, they would each determine what their assignment was going to be while they were serving in the temple. And the responsibility to light the incense, to burn the incense, was such a special opportunity that a priest would only get that opportunity once in their lifetime. And in fact, there were many priests that never ever got the opportunity to burn incense. And if it was your opportunity to do that, your friends and your family would be excited for you because you get this special opportunity and they would kind of sit outside and wait on you with a little bit of trepidation because, you know, to walk into the presence of God in the holy place, that's pretty intimidating. And this is an honor to be able to do something like that. And this is what Zechariah had the opportunity to do. Not by accident, God had determined on this date at this time, Zechariah would be born for this moment and he drew that lot and he is in the holy place. Watch what happens. Verse 10, and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And now Zechariah is gonna respond just like everybody else in the Bible who happens to see an angel. We read this, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and Fear fell upon him, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. That is a shocking birth announcement. That's some kind of gender reveal. You're going to have a boy and here's his name. His name is John. A shocking announcement. I don't know if you heard the one about the 63-year-old woman who went to the doctor's office for a consultation. She was visiting with a young doctor for the first time, and she came out of the exam room screaming. And she runs down the hall, the 63-year-old woman, she's screaming down the hall, and then she sees an older doctor there that knew her. They had a little conversation, and then the older doctor went to the younger doctor and said, what do you think you're doing? Mrs. Terry, 63 years old. She has four children, seven grandchildren, and you tell her she's pregnant? And the young doctor said with a grin, yeah, but it sure cured her hiccups. <laughs> well, that's a shocking birth announcement. So this is what Zechariah gets. This is shocking. It goes on. Gabriel goes on. And you'll have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord and he must not drink wine or strong drink. Does that remind you of anything that we've studied in the past? Remember the Nazarite vow when we're going through the book of Judges. This is a Nazarite vow, very similar to it. Uh, in fact, John, John the Baptist is the last prophet of the Old Testament. He's the last one because he died before the New Testament was ushered in. So if ever you're given a little quiz, theology quiz, John the Baptist, last Old Testament prophet. So not to have any drink or wine or strong drink, and he will be filled, this is different, he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, well, how shall I, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man. And my wife is advanced in years. I think that's human nature coming out. It's human nature to doubt the supernatural, especially here in the West. Here, here we have Zechariah, and he's like, how's this, how's this going to happen? He's face to face with an angel, uh, an angel that's just popped up out of nowhere in the holy place. And he has all of these doubts. He's going to want proof. How, how, do, how can I know? Seems like we just want more and more proof before we'll believe. And maybe you're in that place. Maybe you're fairly new to the faith. You've started coming to church and you're like, well, I don't know if I really trust everything about God and what Jesus says about himself in the Bible. And you have all of these different things and you're just wondering, man, if I could just get some more proof, if I could have some hard evidence, well, then I would believe. But friend, at some point, faith has to kick in. You have to get to the point where you're not gonna test God with a whole bunch of proofs in your life that you will step across that line of faith and trust that he is who he says that he is. 
So here's Zechariah. He's like, I don't, how's this going to happen? I'm not quite sure. And the angel answers him in verse 19. The angel answered him and said, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Now, throughout the nativity, throughout the birth of Christ, we see angels everywhere. The interesting thing about angels, they all seem to have different assignments. And we know a couple angels by name. We have Gabriel here. And Gabriel is associated, his assignment is often bringing good news. And we also know the name of another angel named Michael. And Michael the angel is often associated with strength or war. And so here is uh, Gabriel, and he says, this is what's going to happen. Your wife who's been barren is advanced in years. She's going to have a baby. His name is going to be John. Zachariah says, I need some proof. The angel's like, all right, you want some proof? I'm going to give you some proof and a bit of rebuke. Look at the next verse. Gabriel said, and behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. So now, Zachariah's not going to be able to speak. He's going to be mute, and that would have to be frustrating. He's really only going to be able to communicate through signs or writing things down on a tablet. Then it says this, and the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. Now, this is one of the moments in the Bible that I just wish we had video. I, I wish we could see this, right? What is this moment like? What does it look like to have this guy who's shocked, right? Probably walks out pretty pale, like he's just been frightened by an angel. But now he can't talk. He can't really tell people what has happened, so he's giving signs. And I imagine, I don't know how I would try to do that if I didn't know sign language. How, how do I look at an angel and then come out and try to explain to you? Like, I just saw an angel. He probably walked out and he went. <laughs> people are like, are you all right? And he's like. Are you having a stroke, Zachariah? I mean, what, what are you doing? He didn't know. Like, what's the sign for angel? Now, fortunately for us, on staff, uh, Rebecca Bishop, she's on staff. She knows sign language. So I asked Rebecca, what is the sign for angel? Just so I know. And, and she said, this, this is the sign for angel. All right? So uh, if you ever see an angel and you're mute and you can't talk, this is the sign for angel. Uh, it's also the sign for dandruff. So, I mean... <laughs> I made that up. That's just how I would do it. But that's the sign for angel, all right? So he's making all these signs. It's got to be very interesting. And then uh, it says this. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Still mute, can't talk. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. So that right there, that is a great birth announcement. That's a great gender reveal. Zechariah, Elizabeth, it's a boy. Now, Gabriel, he's not done delivering, dad joke, he's not done delivering good news. We read on. In the sixth month, now this is the sixth month of Elizabeth being pregnant. So in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. So here we have Luke two times in this one verse saying that Mary is a virgin. He's trying to get something across to us. And it's something that's very important. Jesus was born of a virgin. And that's really important for us to understand doctrinally. It's important for us not to dismiss this miracle. And say, well, no, she's just a young person and it, it really didn't happen that way. No, she is a virgin. And that's what Luke is trying to get across. And it's important to understand because of this. We need to understand that Jesus didn't have a biological human father. His father is God. And the importance of that, the Bible tells us that we inherit our sin from Adam. We inherited sin. We have a sin nature. Jesus does not have a sin nature. He is sinless. His father is God. He is born in a unique way, unlike any other. And it needs to be that way because Jesus is the God man. He, he is God, he is divine, and he is also 
human, very unique, never happened before. And it needs to be this way. Because if Jesus were just another individual like you or like me, was fallible, had sin, had wrath already over his head, then he would not be a perfect sacrifice. But Jesus is God, never sinned. And so this sinless son of God, who had been planned from the garden, has arrived on the scene, born of a virgin, not by accident. This has happened by the will of God. This has been prophesied earlier, 700 years before, even through Isaiah, Isaiah 7, 14, we read it earlier. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name, what? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God with us. Not just God with us in spirit, but God with us in person. This, this is God with us in, in the form of a human being. This is a unique being, born of a virgin, promised by God. And so Gabriel comes to Mary. He says this, and he, Gabriel, came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. In the Latin, that is the Ave Maria. Greetings, Mary. But she was greatly troubled. She was troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, the very same thing that he said to Zechariah, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. The word, the name Jesus means savior. It means one who will rescue. Gabriel says he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And here we are. 2,000 years later, and there is no end to his kingdom. Here we are as a church gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, not by our own doing, not by our own strength, not by our own wisdom, but by the call of God and the establishment that he has made before the foundations of the earth, that there would be a king and there would be a kingdom. And Jesus continues to reign on his throne to this very day. He has ascended into heaven and he's seated at the right hand of God. And he is king of all kingdoms. And he is calling to himself citizens to enter into that kingdom. And it is my prayer that you're a citizen of heaven. That your kingdom, the kingdom that you live in, isn't just simply the United States. You have stepped into the kingdom of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ because of what he did on your part. And then calling you to himself, filling you with his Holy Spirit. Your heaven, or your home rather, it is in heaven and it is because there is a king, Jesus. He is king today. And I know we look at the world and we say, okay, it doesn't seem like he's really ruling over certain kingdoms. Oh, but he is. He is ruler. He has allowed a period of time, even in this world, that would push away against him and do all that they could to ignore him. He's allowed a period of time for you to hear the good news so that you could enter this kingdom, so that you could be a citizen of heaven, so that you would respond to Emmanuel, God with us, the Savior, the Lord, King Jesus, that you would make him king of your kingdom. There's no end to his kingdom. It says this then, and Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? Luke keeps driving it home. I'm a virgin. And the angel answered, well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And watch this. Gabriel says, for nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. And I think that's a good verse to memorize. I think that's a good verse to hide in your heart. For nothing will be impossible with God. Luke 1, 37. Nothing 
will be impossible for God. Nothing. Walking on water, the mute to speak, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, the dead to rise again, nothing's impossible for God. He can raise the dead to life. He can take those who are spiritually dead and breathe life into them once again. He can transform a heart, transform a life in such a way that it now belongs to him and he breathes life into it. Nothing is impossible for this God. All of the difficulties, all of the problems that we face in this world, nothing is impossible for this God. Every now and then we just need to remind ourselves, this is a God who is in heaven. He exists. He is there now. And nothing is impossible for that God. He rules. He reigns. He is seated on high. And nothing is impossible with your God. This is good news. J.B. Phillips, he wrote a book titled, Your God is Too Small. And he said, if you have trouble, for instance, with a virgin birth, It's not that the virgin birth is too big of a miracle. It is that your concept of God is too limited. For nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. And this is what Gabriel explains to Mary, the virgin. Nothing's impossible with God. He's breaking into our time and space. God is up to something. And Mary then, in verse 38, she says, All right, I am the Lord's servant. May it be unto me as you have spoken. I think about Mary and I just think about her willingness just to simply take that step of faith. Not looking for a bunch of proof or different things. She's just like, yep, I'm in. And I think about just all of the responsibilities. Like she, she jumped right in with all of the challenges that would come with her being pregnant, with all the burdens, all the accusations that are going to come her way. And yet with humility and willingness, she says, yes, 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 I'm the Lord's servant. And then in verse 39, it tells us that that she then hurries off to her relative's house, Elizabeth. So she goes to Elizabeth's house where we've got mute Zechariah there. Now she, she gets there, and when she shows up, this is what we read. And when Elizabeth, relative of Mary, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby, this is John the Baptist, this is John, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think this verse right here, this is a great reminder that children in the womb, they're not blobs of tissue. They're human beings with a soul. And here's John, he, he's a human being with a soul, it's a unique soul because it's already filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary comes, and in this holy moment, there's worship that just spontaneously begins to, to break out. And I would love to be on the outside just kind of watching this moment where there's something that happens on the inside with John the Baptist, and he knows my Lord is here. And then all of a sudden, Elizabeth begins to realize, oh my goodness, the Messiah. This is going to be the mother of the Messiah. She goes on, she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Such a beautiful moment. And I think that's exactly what Mary needed to hear in this moment as well. And then Mary, she she begins to sing this song. She's praising God for his goodness. And in Latin, it's called Mary's Magnificat. Uh, She's just praising God for his goodness. It's a spontaneous worship that begins to happen out of the overflow of her heart. And she begins to sing. And I've asked Josh if he would come out and sing it for you. I'm kidding. I I like scaring him. I like, I what? Yeah, no, he's not coming. All right, so she, she breaks into this song. So we don't have time necessarily to go through the whole song, but it's a beautiful moment where there's just this realization, okay, God is doing something. All of these promises, all of the things, this is real. God is among us, and they begin to worship him and adore him. And then, and we'll, we'll get further into to what's going to happen with Mary once we get into chapter 2. Here, Luke then stays with Elizabeth and what's happening. Mary goes back to Nazareth about three months later, right? So that would make nine months. She showed up at six months. She leaves at three months, was there most likely for the birth. And then he starts talking about the the birth of John. And when he's born, Elizabeth tells all the people that are gathered around, his name is John. Because that's what the angel said his name will be. 
His name is John. And all the relatives, all the friends, they said, well, that's odd because you have no relatives that are named John. You don't, you don't have a John in, in your family. And so uh, she said, no, his name is John. And then look at verse 62. This is interesting. Verse 62. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. That's funny, right? He's mute, not deaf. They're making signs to him. Have you, have you ever noticed that? Like sometimes we just kind of get it confused and if somebody can't speak, people talk really loud. They're like, I can hear. I can't speak. So they're, they're making these signs to a guy that could just hear them. All right, it's just funny. I probably would have done the same thing and been like, ah, sorry, dude. Uh, so anyway, and he asked for a writing tablet and he wrote, I'm mute, not deaf. No, no, he wrote. He wrote, his name is John. His name is John. And they all wondered. But at that very moment, you know what happened. He got his voice back. Just like the angel said. And at that moment, he's filled with the spirit. He just begins to prophesy and praise God. And we get all these songs. We get all of this worship. It's so rich in Luke chapter 1. And there's something that I want us to remember as we go from this place. What I'd like us to remember is that the very same idea, the very same phrase that they heard, Zachariah and Mary, is given to you and is given to me. And it's this. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And every time that the Bible keeps saying, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, the reason is always the same. God will be with you. Emmanuel, God with you. And yet in our lives and we come into this place and we're just so weighed down and our hearts have heavy and we've got all of these challenges and we've got health problems and financial problems and we've got just job issues and maybe school pressures, maybe you've got some family issues in your life. I mean, the list is endless of all those burdens and challenges that we bring into this place. And I believe God would say the same thing to you today that he said then, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I hear your prayers. Nothing is impossible for me. Stiffen your spine. Realize that I am here. Friend, don't be afraid. You have nothing to fear. God is near. God is here in this moment. And the Bible tells us that nothing, nothing, nothing will separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. Nothing will do it. He is our refuge. He is our strength. He is, he's an ever-present help, the Bible says, in times of trouble. And I realize that you've come in today, some of you, and your heart is heavy, and you've got these burdens, and there's these challenges and fears and worries and stress. And I just want to remind you, don't be afraid. Our God is on his throne. And he is Emmanuel. He is God. And he's with us. He's with you. And I would just like to say, and this is kind of laid on my heart this morning, that if you've come in and this is you, like you came in and you're weighed down and you're burdened and there is stress and there is worry and there is fear, I just want to encourage you to do something. This week, would you open your Bible to Psalm 46? Psalm 46, you don't have to do it now, but just sometime this week, open the Bible maybe each morning to Psalm 46 and read the whole chapter and meditate on it. To meditate just simply means I'm going to let this wash over my heart. I'm going to realize what all of this means for me. That my God is with me. That he sees me in the midst of this pain that I'm going through right now. And I'm not alone. And from this point forward, I will not be afraid. Because nothing's impossible for my God. And he is with me. He has sent his son. It's a boy. But more than a son. He's Emmanuel. He's Savior, Lord, King. Let's pray. Father, for all my friends in this room, we get into Christmas season and it's just such a mixed bag of emotions. We can have a whole bunch of joy, a whole bunch of longing for joy, but then at the same time, we just feel the weight of life and the burdens and the difficulties and the fears rise up. But for all my friends in this room, 
But I pray that our hearts would be wrapped around this truth that you are securely on your throne, that nothing is impossible with you, that you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. Your spirit is here, and we will trust you. Not looking for a whole bunch of proof that you exist, but by faith, knowing that you are here, trusting your word, trusting that you are a good God who sees us in the midst of our trials and problems and issues, and you will never abandon us. And for that, we give you praise and glory.